Back in April of 2013, I went through something that I haven't been able to talk about. I was paid a significant amount of money to stay quiet, in return for signing a 10-year agreement to shut the hell up. Now that time is up, I've considered my options. I could just let this go and never speak of it again. I won't gain anything from speaking out, and I've got a lot to lose. But then again, this is just an anonymous post online, words have less meaning that way. West Virginia. It was hotter than usual, without a whiff of wind. I was coming home from a visit to my aunt. She'd broken her leg and couldn't leave her house. I was just making my way back home, taking the I-64 out of Lewisburg. It all started with the radio. It was playing that one Macklemore song that I'd heard a hundred times over. The sound was cutting in and out in a quick staccato, and then disappeared completely. I could hear cars honking up front as a line began to form. There was a sway in the trees as if greater and greater pressure was being put on them, and I could hear wind rushing against the left side of the car, forcing me to pull the other way to compensate. I closed the sunroof as a dust cloud blew past, staining the windshield, and then a rumble. It sounded like thunder, but from the ground, like a groaning bellow growing louder and clearer by the second. As it reached its peak, I could see trees toppling over. A small Kia got pushed off balance and swerved off the road. As the sound died down, the road devolved into chaos. Some were desperately changing lanes, others were stepping on the brakes. I got my door scraped as the car behind me sped past. The radio was playing an automated message, a local emergency alert referred to as a geological event. We were asked to turn off all air conditioning, slow down, and divert to the nearest exit. It was in repeat in a monotone voice. Geological event. No air conditioning. Slow down. Divert to nearest exit. <sighs> Minutes passed. There was a line forming further down the road. Police officers blocking all the lanes in all directions. Leaving a highway exit was the only option. Some folks were trying to push past the blockades, but were forced back at gunpoint. I could see the officers wearing gas masks and riot shields. We were waved in. I followed the exit and got directed to the right. There was an open field that we used as a sort of impromptu parking lot. Cars were being waved in and parked in a way that boxed us in, leaving us no room for us to open our doors in either direction unless we got parked at the edge. Four lines of cars from about 10 to 15 vehicles were put in a line. Surplus vehicles were directed further down the road. The place was packed. I got stuck in the second row about six cars in. Pretty much everyone around me was on their phones. I didn't have anyone to call though, and there seemed to be an issue going on with the signal. The radio was still repeating the same emergency message too. Voices were getting louder. A man, two cars from my left, leaned out of the gap in his door and screamed at the officers to answer his question. They responded immediately with a warning shot straight into the air. STAY IN YOUR VEHICLE! They screamed. LOCK YOUR DOORS! I'M NOT TELLING YOU AGAIN! A couple of folks were filming, but there seemed to be trouble actually uploading it. We were losing bandwidth. And it didn't take long until phone signals were completely blocked. I think a video or two of that officer firing into the air made it online, though. They were patrolling back and forth. We were told to stay in our vehicles, windows up, doors closed and locked, engines off. I could hear people talking in their cars. Someone said that there had been a natural gas leak from the geological event, and that combustible engines would spark an explosion. Others were talking about a terrorist attack. There were no answers, and the officers weren't eager to talk. After about an hour, things were getting ugly. People were hungry, thirsty, and restless. One officer stepped up to the front cars, handing out water bottles, crackers, and processed cheese slices. He had to step from one car to another, denting hoods with his steel-tipped shoes. They were also handing out thick plastic hygiene bags for people who needed to relieve themselves. Use them, seal them up, drop them out the door, then lock up and wait. I crawled into the back seat, pulled down my cap, and tried to relax. I'd been playing some games on my phone, but the battery was running low, and I wanted to save some, so I settled for having a nap instead. The sweat was stinging my eyes, not because of how warm it was, but because of how nervous I was. No matter what I did, I felt trapped, and the car felt smaller and smaller. I couldn't get out of it, and I wanted to. And it physically hurt me to think about how little control I had. Is this what claustrophobia felt like? A couple of other officers were discussing by the front line. One of them had a white cotton glove on, which he used to wipe off the hood of some of the front cars. The glove was taken off and put into a bag, which in turn was sealed up with a hot air gun. I was starting to get the impression that our cars had been covered in something. I wasn't the only one considering it either. There were two college kids in the car to my left, and they were discussing it too. 
Anthrax, one of them said. It's gotta be. Nah, cold dust, the other one chuckled. They just don't want to share. You know what? The first one groaned. I honestly hope to God that you're right. You're not, but I hope that you are. <laughs> Fuck you. I joined in the conversation shortly after. I offered another explanation. Something combustible. Something that might blow up if we started our cars. They were willing to consider this. The car behind me couldn't hear us, but the driver held up a notebook with the text, If we don't know what, it's gotta be aliens. I couldn't tell if they were serious, but they weren't laughing about it. A man in his 50s and what looked like his daughter. There was a couple of other folks in other cars. A man in a black shirt, sort of looked like a preacher without a collar. Two middle-aged women with a kid in the back seat. A fat man blaring Johnny Cash from a stereo. And a couple with a teenage son who couldn't stop drumming on the window. We'd been stuck for about two, maybe two and a half hours, when a truck rolled in. One of those with a large water tank. It was unmarked. Looked civilian. As it rolled in, they were called out on a megaphone. We'll be hosing your vehicles down, they said. Keep everything locked and closed. They'll be covering your vehicle with a protective plastic while we wait for it to dry. After that, we'll start letting you go in an orderly manner. I repeat... Most of us were relieved. It was only a matter of time now, and it was starting to get dark. They were getting up on the cars, hosing them down thoroughly. It smelled sort of like chlorine, so maybe they'd mixed up something into the water. As they came to my car, they stepped up onto it and double-checked the sunroof, making sure that it was locked and secured. They sprayed the car down, bathing it in chemical stink. It kinda gets stuck in the back of your throat. It took a long time for them to finish, at least an hour or two. After that, they were rolling out a kind of plastic cover at the short side of the lot. The kind that you use to protect pools, or rain covers for a football field. They used two square cars to slowly drape the thing over the entire lot, securing the edges with large rocks. Please stay calm, they called out as the plastic crawled over us. I know this is uncomfortable, but this is for your own safety. Once the cleansing is done, you will be free to go. Stay inside your vehicle at all times. I repeat. I did as I was told. I stayed inside, and I watched that plastic cover sweep over me. It felt like getting buried alive. All lights went out, leaving me in complete darkness, accompanied only by the vague, disembodied voices of the others. The college kids were talking about where they were going to go after this. Someone was honking, not sure if it was to show support or discontent. Someone else was cheering. I took my last swig of water, washing down my final plane cracker. I got in the driver's seat. I could hear as they finished moving the plastic cover and parking their squad vehicles. I waited patiently, figuring that it may be another hour or so. They hadn't really given us a timeline, but I could breathe a little easier, sort of. I was going back and forth between feeling empowered with my hands on the wheel and feeling like I was stuck in a metal coffin. It was so dark and everything smelt of plastic and chemicals, like a car wash stuck in time. As the excitement died down, I paid a little more attention to the background sounds. I sort of filtered out the various discussions from the nearby cars, and somewhere in the distance, I heard raised voices. It wasn't coming from the cars, but from the officers. Whatever they were talking about, it was a heated discussion. An hour came and went, and people were getting impatient. More cars were honking, others were yelling, demanding answers. I couldn't get my leg to stop shaking. The more I thought about what was going on here, the smaller the car felt. I was hyper-focused on things that I couldn't control. I was a little thirsty and I was out of water. I needed to use the bathroom and I wanted to stretch my legs and go for a walk. I wanted to breathe fresh air and get out of that awful chemical taste out of my mouth. I heard cars starting, accelerating. The truck was moving. Somewhere off to the side. We need you to stay in the vehicle! A voice screamed over a megaphone. Do not leave for any reason! Stay in your vehicle! Cars were speeding off. Not many, but a couple. And then, quiet. The officers left us there. Everyone was quiet. A couple of folks had opened up their phones, using them as flashlights to look from car to car, looking out over a sea of vehicles. All of us were trapped under that dark cover. I could see a handful of lights cut off by sharp silhouettes. I couldn't make out who was in the dark. It was all just people. Anonymous. I heard a gasp somewhere in the back. There was a metallic clunk, like when the officers climbed atop our cars to get us our water. 
There was a careful cheer as some folks figured out that they were taking off the plastic cover. But that wasn't it. Instead, there were more footsteps. The cheer slowly died down as more and more footsteps pattered across our cars. I stopped counting after a dozen. The silhouettes in the cars were still. We all held our breaths, waiting for an answer to show itself. What the hell was going on, and what was that sound? Somewhere off to my right, I heard a voice. Who's up there? It sounded like an older man. I'd seen a pickup truck that way earlier. Almost as a response, the footsteps stopped. There was a faint clicking sound, like someone snapping their tongue against the roof of their mouths. And from further away, a click in response. From somewhere to my left, a couple of clicks. Then, a cascade of clicks. Dozens, maybe hundreds. There was an awful metallic noise coming from my right. Then, a break in glass. A scream. A cut short, followed by several irregular taps of car horns. One of the silhouettes in this distance turned into a blur as something passed through the windshield, cutting through the plastic cover. Somewhere in the front row, uh, the car was cut wide open. Someone was pulled out from their seat. Two cars back, there I was. There was more glass breaking. It sounded like a wild animal got in. I could see wind hint from red splattered against the passenger side windows. I wasn't getting any air. I could feel my heart beating through my chest as my arms started shaking. My hands were cramped around the steering wheel, and I felt sweat dripping down from my shoulders. I couldn't control it. I couldn't even see what was going on. But these sounds, these screams, they awakened something primal. There was danger, a threat. My body knew long before I did. The college kids in the cars next to me were ducking down. One of them waved a hand at me as if telling me to get down. I nodded. I scrambled into the back seat. I couldn't see where I was putting my hands or my feet. Everything is different in the dark. As I tumbled my way over, my foot accidentally tapped on the car horn. It was a quick tap, a fraction of the second, but to me, it was the loudest sound in the world. I was lying on my stomach in the back seat. Within a few seconds, something heavy climbed onto the roof of the hood of my car. I could feel my car buckling. It was much heavier than the man who had passed out water bottles. I held my hands in front of my mouth to stop the panting, but I just ended up snorting sweat instead. My nose stung as I bit my tongue, listening to every metallic groan as whatever was outside moved and shifted. And from behind my car, a click in response. There was no lights being held up anymore. Everyone was cowering, going quiet. I pushed myself up against the door, behind the driver's seat, trying to make myself as small as possible. I could hear the frame from the car complain as something slowly moved. When it came to my sunroof, there was a slight crack that made it stop. Another crack. I suddenly shook my head, as if trying to ask the car to stop. That thing was going to break. And it did. My legs were showered with glass as a big blob of plastic cover dipped into my car. Something big came tumbling into the front seat, still covered in protective plastic. It's clicking turning from a careful questioning-like noise to a never-ending barrage. It was calling for help, alerting others. It was cutting its way through the plastic. There were footsteps coming from every direction, some of them leaping from car to car, some of them leaping far enough to skip a car as they hurried. I was going to be swarmed within seconds. I fumbled with my hands, accidentally cutting my thumb on the broken glass. I managed to open the passenger side door, but even at its widest, even when pressing it into the college kid's car, it wasn't enough room to get out. Still, I had to try. I pressed myself into the gap and exhaled as much as I could, flattening my chest. While the thing thrashed around inside my car, I could feel my vision going faint. Black spots popped up at the edge of my vision. My arms were getting weak, and yet by some miracle I made it through. As my face hit the gravel of the makeshift parking lot, I felt a burn of residual chemicals. I swallowed my instinct to run, instead staying on my stomach, forcing myself to crawl under my car. There was more of them. Some of them climbing on, some off. My chest was pressed to the ground as the weight shifted. I heard breaking glass from the windshields, tearing fabric. Something was stuck up there, and it was furious, like a trapped animal. I could hear the college kids mumbling to one another, trying to stay calm, one assuring the other that all they had to do was lay low and stay quiet and wait. Then something slammed into the passenger side door, the one that I'd crawled out of. 
The door was pressed up against the neighboring car, and then fell haphazardly to the ground, completely off the hinges. An ink-black bird-like foot touched the ground right next to me. I've looked it up since. There were three toes forward and one toe backed, all clawed, and sactodactyl feet, similar to that of many birds of prey, except larger than a human foot, and with smooth, oil-slick skin. It must have been heavy, at least 400 pounds. If the clicking noise came from its mouth, I can approximate that it was somewhere between 6'7 to 6'9, or taller. It could have been hunched over. How it managed to walk in the gap between the vehicles is beyond me, but I suspect that it's very thin. It daintily walked from my car to the others, as if scanning for something. I could barely see anything in the dark, but this thing seemed to navigate it perfectly. It didn't bump into anything. There was a tap on the glass from the car behind me, to my right, and someone got startled, a short scream, and the hunt was on. This time was different. It must have caused some kind of chain reaction as all of the sudden plastic cover was getting torn off left and right. People were clawing their way out of the cars. I heard someone kicking against the windshield. Another was trying to open the door. I could hear it slamming against the side of the car next to them. And off in the distance, there was gunfire. Just a couple of shots. The college kids in the car next to me slammed their doors open and followed my lead. They rolled onto the ground and under their car. There was a little light coming up from above as the cover had been torn. Their faces were red from tears. One of them had been desperately trying to call for help on his phone. The other one grabbed the phone out of his hand. A short scuffle ensued, ending with them putting on a ringtone and sliding the thing as far to the left as they could. Whatever car that phone had landed under was demolished. Every window broken. Every passenger gone. I could hear the grinding as a seat was ripped in two and thrown away. In a matter of seconds, an entire vehicle was torn to pieces by dozens of those things. Shut up! One of the college kids repeated. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Something reached under my car. It scraped against the sole of my shoe, tearing a hole all the way to my big toe. I hurried forward, scurrying like a lizard. The college kid noticed and followed suit. I don't think they thought about it too much. It was just movement, and they went for it. I made it two cars down before I got stuck. There was something dark in the way, and I couldn't get around it without exposing myself. I couldn't see what it was, but it didn't take long for me to figure it out. There was a meaty crunch, as if someone was biting chunks out of a piece of meat. It was struggling to get through the fabric of their clothes, making a snapping noise as threads gave away. A pool of blood rolled under the car, staining the tip of my fingers. It was still warm. One of those things was eating a victim. I hunkered down trying to remember to breathe, and I stayed there, waiting for a chance. Any chance. I must have stayed there for at least an hour, hearing every bite, every crack of bone and snap of sinew, satisfied clicking noises as it finished its meal. It wandered off, dragging the remains along. They were moving forward. Something heavy walked over the car that I was hiding under, dragging a body along. Slowly, the footsteps disappeared. It was quiet again, and in that quiet, I found my footing. I made my way to the edge of the plastic cover. I listened for a final time, and then pushed one of the weights away and slipped through. They were gone, and I was out. I could feel my chest growing lighter, allowing me to breathe. I wanted to cry from relief. A breeze was picking up, drying the sweat from my brow and carrying the smell of grass. Stepping back, I turned towards the sea of cars to see how bad the damage was. And then I saw one. It was a bit off to the side, perching on top of an old Honda. At a glance, it looked like a tall person covered in a slick black ink. But looking closer, you could see the strange bird-like feet, the pointed nails, the long row of shark-like teeth on a mouth that was far too wide. I froze. The thing rose to its full length, easily over seven feet tall. It looked ready to pounce on me. I had nothing to defend myself with. I couldn't make any sudden moves. I, I couldn't even be halfway under the car before that thing would bound over me. A hundred thoughts raced through my mind, and there was nothing I could do. I was out of options. But the thing just looked at me. It raised a slice of raw meat, blood dripping onto the plastic cover. It looked at me curiously, taking a bite. Then, as if nothing happened, it wandered off, satiated. I was left there, shaking like a dry leaf, and with the last of those things gone, all that was left 
was the panic. It didn't take long for the officers to return. The plastic cover was removed, but we couldn't go home. Not after this. Some folks signed a waiver and were let go immediately. They weren't allowed to talk about what they had seen, and in return, they'd get a hefty sum of insurance money. Others demanded answers and were taken into custody for obstruction of justice. A few others still were too panicked to make any kind of sense and had to be checked out by medical personnel. A total of 14 people died. It was described by a combination of causes. A traffic pileup, carbon monoxide poisoning, animal attack. I think there was even something about an escaped convict too. Excuses all over the place. And the times were all wrong spread out throughout a couple of days to make more smoothly blend into accident statistics. And if you wanted to go home and get your insurance money, you had to sign a non-disclosure. I did too. I know the college kids did as well. Goddamn miracle they made it out, but I saw them. 34 cars had to be towed, 18 people wounded, 6 seriously so, 4 people lost at least one limb. One guy had an arm ripped off halfway up to his collarbone. I don't know how he survived. Most people never saw those things up close. They just remember the screams and the breaking glass. Sometimes at night that's all I hear too. Closing my eyes reminds me of lying under those cars, feeling the pressure as the weight shifted. I still get trouble breathing. I still think a part of me is stuck there. It stayed in my vehicle.